Welcome to The Vergecast, the flagship podcast of anti-glare coatings. I'm your friend David Pierce, and I am doing my taxes. It's that time of year, my friends, the one time a year I need a printer, mine is currently broken, and suddenly I have to pretend that I understand a lot more than I actually do about, like, complicated financial documents. And honestly, most of all, this is the time of year that I most wish I were more organized during the rest of the year, so that this wasn't such a painful process. I have this, like, beautiful filing system that I never touch until right about now, and then I regret all of my life choices over the past 12 months. But I don't really see that dynamic changing anytime soon. So here we are. Anyway, we have an awesome show for you today, but some quick housekeeping stuff before we get to that. First thing you'll notice, it's Tuesday and this episode is publishing. We are from now on going to be publishing The Vergecast on Tuesdays and Fridays. There are a bunch of reasons for that, but mostly it just lets us cover more stuff more quickly. When we had to wait until Wednesdays, it felt like we were doing a show and then really quickly doing another show and then not doing a show for a bunch of days. So this just kind of evenly spaces the Vergecast a little better. It'll let us be more on top of the news. It'll let us do all kinds of stories and it won't, you know, bunch our episodes up quite so much in your feed. Hope it's going to be great. Hope it doesn't screw up any of your routines. Please let us know what you think. Also, we are going to start having a full post on TheVerge.com with all of our show notes, a whole bunch of links, lots of information about every single episode. We've heard all of you asking for better show notes and more links to stuff you can read about that we talk on the show. So we're just going to start doing that. At TheVerge.com slash VergeCast, you'll be able to find all of that every single time we publish an episode. That's a great place to leave comments, tell us what you think of the episode. We're going to try to do a good job of being in the comments and talking to you, and we want to hear all the dumb things we say and all the times that you agree with me and not Neli, put it in the comments, tell us everything. We have lots more changes coming soon, actually, especially on YouTube. So stay tuned. The Vergecast as a thing is not changing. So don't worry. But we have little ways we think we can do everything a little better and make it all more fun to watch and listen to and download and all that good stuff. So lots more coming. Stay tuned. All right, enough of that. Let's get to the show. The first thing we're going to do today is we're going to talk to Josh Miller, who is the CEO of a startup called The Browser Company, which is trying to basically nothing short of reinvent the web browser and do some big AI stuff and generally maybe change the internet forever. That all sounds big and ambitious, but it is big and ambitious, and it's fascinating. Then we're going to dig into all things Galaxy S24 with Allison Johnson, because it's only February and we might have already seen the most important Android phone of the year. All of that is coming up in just a second, but first, I have to go finish this one thing on this tax form, which is literally a form I've never heard of before. Hopefully this only takes a minute. This is The Verge Cast. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Over the last couple of years, this browser called Arc has become super popular. It's available on Mac and iOS. It's coming to Windows soon. People are super into it, which is weird. Honestly, I mean, when was the last time people got excited about a web browser? The new Netscape. Power and ease of use. It's free at Netscape.com. But Arc has some cool, unusual ideas about how browsers should work. And it's just so much nicer to use than Chrome or Edge. It's just caught on for a lot of people as a result. Last week, the browser company, which is the company that makes Arc, released a new mobile app called Arc Search. It's a mobile browser and a pretty good one, but it's way more than that. It's also an AI tool called Browse For Me that is like a combination of search engine, AI chatbot, web page maker, and a bunch of other things. It's confusing to explain and frankly, kind of hard. So let me just give you an example. Let's see, the Grammys were the other day. So I go into Arc Search on my phone and I say, what happened at the Grammys on Sunday? And then I type that in and then I hit Browse For Me in Arc. And it takes a second. It says it's reading six web pages, CBS News, New York Times, stuff like that. And then it pops up this page that says highlights of the 2024 Grammy Awards. This is a completely AI generated web page. It has a bunch of things at the top, like Killer Mike, the rapper was arrested. Taylor Swift won her fourth album of the year award. Uh, women dominated. There was a physical altercation, apparently. It just says that at the top. And then it has some search results. And then it has more information about Killer Mike being arrested, more information about Taylor Swift's wins, more notable wins, including Tracy Chapman, who didn't win but performed a duet. This is the thing about AI, right? None of this is perfect. But anyway, it's this big, long list of information and links and media and videos to watch that is all completely AI generated. 
it is building a web page for me every single time I search. It's neat, and it doesn't always work, as you can see, and it's weird, like a lot of AI stuff is weird, but it also points at something really big about how the internet is changing. What does it mean for the web that I can just get information like this? ARC is essentially just Googling for me, which is handy, but it kind of changes the whole dynamic of the internet. So I grabbed Josh Miller, the browser company's CEO, to talk all of that through. What ARC wants to be, how it's going to break the web apart, and lots more. I've been talking to Josh for years. I find ARC really fascinating, honestly. And he's always had these really big ideas about what a browser could be, and also why he thinks a browser is worth building in the first place. And if you rewind four or five years ago, we're in this age back then where a couple of operating systems rule the world, right? Android, iOS, Windows, Mac. You want to do anything interesting, you have to reckon with those OSs. And they are the ones that have the real control over how things work. But Josh had this inkling at the time that the web, and specifically web-based apps, were making a comeback. Figma, Notion, Slack, even Discord. These mm -hmm. are all just secretly web apps running in web browsers, pretending they're not web browsers. And so the foundational observation of the browser company was... Oh my goodness, the next operating system is right in front of our eyes. It's going to look more like a web browser. It's going to be a web browser designed for the web because essentially, to use a Wall Street term, the cloud is underestimated and the shift to the cloud is underestimated. It is a fundamental shift that we take for granted that all of the things in our life related to technology are actually not in our lives anymore. They're out on a server or many servers somewhere. And so the bet of the browser company was if you reimagine the interface to those things, to the internet, that would effectively become the most important operating system in our lives. And to be totally self-aware, that was kind of all we had at the time. So that's the frame here, right? The web is the thing. It's as if the App Store was already around in 2004 or 2005 or whatever, and Apple went, huh, somebody should build an iPhone to run all these things. That might be cool. It's exactly backwards in the most interesting way. That's Arc's big plan. And now with AI, Arc can do that more and bigger and faster. But what is it trying to do? And is what it's trying to do what we want both as users and like people on the internet? So that's where Josh and I really got into it. I asked him, you know, you've been shouting all this nonsense about web browsers for years now. And this new app, Arc Search, feels like the closest thing yet to getting to that idea about what an operating system can do to the web. So does this feel like you've finished, like you've done the thing? The first thing I'll say is now I know you thought I was spewing nonsense for these past few years that we've been friends. <laughs> Listen, we're all spewing nonsense most of the time. It's okay. We're all spewing nonsense. That's true. Another thing people don't <laughs> tell you when you're younger. Yes, but not for reasons you may think. Okay. The reason that this new iPhone app, Arc Search, feels like the truest representation of what we've been saying for many years my dad has this phrase that he told me way too many times growing up, which is disregard the words. And the idea of this phrase is that we, we add these labels to things, these nouns, and they gain all this cultural meaning to the point where we almost forget that they were made up. They don't actually mean it. They don't represent natural law. Yeah. And what we've been saying from the beginning and the reason that we use these phrases, the internet computer and operating system for the web, as imperfect as they were and as ambiguous as they were, is that we were trying to say is that if you approach software and interface it to the internet from a human perspective, what does David need to do today? What does David's wife have to get done today? Why are they turning to their computer? And you work backwards from that you probably don't need a thing called a web browser or a search engine or a web page because those are random nouns that were invented 25 years ago. The reason that Arc Search represents in its purest form to date our big idea is that it's something different. Mm -hmm. It's something new. It's kind of hard to put a label on it. You struggled with it in your review. Is it a browser? Is it a search engine? Is it AI? Is it something else? And that makes me really excited because that is what we were trying to do. We were trying to start with what does David need to do when he's at the restaurant with a bunch of friends and they have a random question about something that comes up in conversation? Find the answer to that as quickly as possible. And we should employ whatever tools and nouns and technologies we need to do that as quickly as possible. 
And yeah, turns out ends up looking a little different than web browsers of 25 years ago and search engines of 25 years ago and web pages of yesteryear. So that's what makes me so excited about Arc Search is it's a reminder to ourselves and everybody that hey, we can invent new nouns. And in fact, if those new nouns are invented to solve problems and realize goals that we have, they might even be better than the old nouns. That's why I'm so excited about it. And one of our principles has always been the idea of a general purpose web browser is deeply flawed. So you just brought up a bunch of things that I want to talk about, but we've started to talk about the internet in a really different way than we used to, where I think you could make the case that we got the internet that we got which I think by and large is a good version of the internet based on this like overall value exchange that everyone agreed on, right? Like Google came up because Google made a bet that what was good for the web would also be good for Google and set itself up as a company that would work that way. And it worked that way for a really long time and it went super well for Google and I think largely went well for the internet. Facebook built on some of the same premises, right? Like there's this idea that I, as a person on the internet, am going to get value out of something. The people who make the tools that I use are also going to get value. That like everywhere along the way, if we can all find win-wins, the it's going to make the internet better. And I think with the advent of AI, what it has come to is, okay, the internet exists. It is now a thing to be mined for your benefit. And I think the the people who are mad at OpenAI and ChatGPT and the, the New York Times suing over the training data, there's this idea that like, well, we made things and you used to take those things, but you would deliver value back to us. And now you're just taking them because the the idea is that the internet is just out there and everything that's out there is out there and you can just have it. And I think one of the things that I thought was really interesting about Arc Search is not only are you doing the LLM stuff, which I think is, is interesting we should talk about, but you're also, you're blocking ads by default, you're blocking trackers by default, you're blocking the cookie pop-ups by default. That's a big series of, I would say, potentially user-centric and maybe internet hostile set of things to do. You rely on the internet to work but you also are sort of tacitly agreeing that the way the internet works doesn't really work. Like, how do you do both of those at the same time? I think if you look back at maybe what some people would say were the glory times for the early web, when, as you're alluding to, maybe the incentives were better aligned and the value exchange was better aligned. I personally remember Craigslist decimating the business models of the offline media companies and and especially newspapers because of their innovations. At this moment in time when we're talking about the value exchange being great, I actually remember a lot of second order negative externalities that came from the web at this glorious moment. Yeah, that's a good point. My belief is that having uh, worked at Facebook uh, after selling my first company there is that anything that transforms our world, again, sociology major, has very positive things that happen and has very negative things that happen, right? Airbnb is one of my favorite products and experiences. It's ruining a lot of cities. The same is true for almost everything that changes how we live our lives. As it relates to LLMs and AI and what you're alluding to in terms of its relationship to the exchange of value, I think the same is true here. I think it is absolutely true that Arc Search. And the fact that we remove the clutter and BS and make you faster and get you what you need with a lot less time is objectively good for the vast majority of people. And it is also true, it breaks something. It breaks a bit of the value exchange. And not just Arc Search, but all of these tools. It's, yeah. it's a one level higher than Arc Search or ChatGPT. We are grappling with a revolution <laughs> in how software works and computers work. And that's going to mess some stuff up. And I totally agree with the premise of the question, which is, hey, something's breaking and it's really going to break soon. I 100% agree. So I think the answer is, I think it will do more positive than negative. And I think it's kind of unbelievable how much of humanity's time has been wasted by how atrocious the mobile web is in support of the search ad business model. And we got to figure out a better way to get content creators and publishers paid because it's not going to work and it's not been working and it's not been working since Craigslist. So that is definitely a challenge for us all to grapple with. I do think the one difference, and I don't want to like dwell on philosophies of AI, but I think the one difference between the like Craigslist example, which is a really good one, and this is that Craigslist built a better product than all of those things, right? Like, in, and I think what we're learning about the media industry in particular is that the media industry spent a long time build, building really crappy products and got eaten alive by better products. 
That just is what it is. And the next reckoning is going to be like, what does it look like for a media company to build product? It's a thing we talk about all the time at The Verge. It's like why we did the redesign of our website the way we did. It's like, as we think about all of our future, it's as much about product as it is about anything else. And the difference between that and what's happening now is that what's happening now with a lot of LLMs, one way to look at it is it's as if Craigslist had taken all of the classifieds out of all of the existing newspapers and just posted them on the internet. And I think people would be like, well, that's not a better product. That's you stealing from me (laughs) and repackaging it in a new way. And I think that would have been a very different version of the conversation. And again, I think there is a lot of like society wide reckoning to do about AI. There are a lot of people who are like, well, the upside is so high that it's worth the you know, investment of all of our stuff into it because we'll get more utility out of it. But I just think like that fundamental question, I don't think has precedent on the internet because it's just never worked like this before. And I don't think we have answers to it, which is going to be fascinating. And now you're right in the middle of it. So congratulations. It's really exciting to think about from a media company perspective, what is the superior product? What is that next evolution of media? And what I would say is candidly, I have a deeper relationship with The Verge than I ever have before. I've been reading The Verge for over a decade now. I have never spent that much time and had that much depth with your with your publication. Now, I'm not saying that the economic incentives of your ad model with podcasts are working out, but that's all to say that in the same way that ARC can rethink our interface to the internet in a new way, thanks to this technology, I think the answer probably lies in the media industry and media companies rethinking what they do as well. Sure. And I will say to your credit, one thing you have said to me many times over the years is that there is a big phase of this for ARC that is figuring out how to like be a good citizen of all of those things. You see this in ARC search, by the way, which is here's what we could have done. You could have typed in a question to ARC search and we could have answered it and given ourselves all of the credit. Right. Look at how smart ARC is. It's the smartest thing that ever existed. In fact, what we do is we say extremely prominently we don't we actually don't even let you do anything else until you read the fact that, hey, we are your browser. We are going to go read these six websites, these six websites, and then we are going to summarize a little bit about what each of those said. And then we're going to link to all of them. We're going to link to them multiple times. We're even going to verify a pull quote from them. And so uh, I think, again, this change is inevitable. I think it's good for most people. I do think their second order externalities. I think it is the responsibility of folks like us to do our best (laughs) with the role that we have to be good citizens. And that's what we try to do here relative to other competing products, which I shouldn't name because I got PR training, (laughs) but I don't think it's enough. And I think the answer to this question is one level higher than the browser company or Verge or anyone else, but it is absolutely something we need to grapple with. So I'm glad you brought up the UX of it all, because I think how is an AI tool supposed to look is my favorite question in the world right now. And I think people on this podcast are tired of hearing me rant about it. But the one thing I believe for sure is that a text box is not the future of the internet. But I'm curious, like the one thing I know about the browser companies, you spend a lot of time prototyping, you spend a lot of time experimenting and building stuff, and you landed on Arc Search the way it is, which is an interesting mix of kind of what I would call like there's media stuff at the top and then there's kind of a like bulleted summary and then there's a bunch of links and then there's more summary and then there's more links. Is that a, is that a fair description of, of the situation? The two things that you're missing that I'm especially proud of is we embed YouTube videos. True. So you can watch videos in line and then we embed verified quotes where we pull a quote from one of the articles and then we use AI and we say, Hey, AI, You actually make stuff up a lot. So do us a favor. This pull quote you told us you pulled, just go double check to make sure it's actually there. And then if it is, then we say, hey, this quote's verified. We can show it. So those are two other interface innovations I'm especially proud of. Okay. So of all of the things you tried and thought about and played with, why did that feel like the right setup? I think we're we're still in this phase again of there are a million ways AI can present itself to you. Most of them right now are chatbots. What about this one stuck out to you as feeling right for our search? So as you mentioned, we prototype a lot. So we tried 
50 variations of that experience before we landed on the exact one you see in Arc Search today. And in fact, down to the tiniest details, like do we show emojis as bullet points or do we just show bullet points? You landed on emojis, which was the right call, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. I take no credit for it. Shout out to Nate. <laughs> the way that we landed on it is I agree with what you said, which is why does everyone think text boxes are like the future? There's got to be something better. But I think the way that we approached it was not, you know, hey, should it be this or should it be that? We really try to approach it as, hey, let's write down throughout the week, what are the things we look up on the go on our phone? Just quickly make a note of it. And then let's go through all that stuff that we turn to our computer in our pocket and our internet for on the go. What are the commonalities? What are the sort of things we wonder about? Okay, great. It looks like I'm really bad at cooking. And at the age of 33, I still don't know how to make couscous. That's problematic for a bunch of reasons. But if I need to know how to make couscous and I've got one hand because my other hand is dirty and the water is boiling and I got other stuff to do, what is the fastest way we can get you the information for that job to be done and the others? And what you end up finding is it's not just a wall of text. It's not just photos. It's not just video. It's sort of a mixture of things, but it's all grounded in not, hey, let's go make a product that is a web page or a text box or a, a photo gallery. But we really try to ground it in what are you what are you turning to this rectangle in your pocket for every day? Mm. <laughs> and how can we craft a dynamic interface that as best as possible tries to shape shift itself to answer exactly what you want? So what you'll notice is if you ask Arc Search for how to cook couscous, you're actually going to get back a, a very different experience than if you asked it, what is the meaning of life, <laughs> for example? Sure. It's very telling to me that the phone was the centerpiece of that. Because one of the things I was going to ask you is, does this same paradigm make sense on a desktop browser? And I almost don't think that it does. One of the things you, you've always said to me, which I think I mostly agree with, is that most people don't want to use technology. <laughs> they have a thing they'd like to get done, and they use technology in service of that. They're not just like goofing around on their phone. They mostly have like a, a thing they'd like to do, and so your job is to help them do it faster. And I think if that's how you think about it, the way you put Arc Search together makes a lot of sense. But in in a world of like, I am just sitting here and I want to like learn as much about Machu Picchu as I can. The idea of delivering me what Arc Search is, which is sort of like a finished product thing, makes a lot less sense. But that's also not what people do on their phones. So, like, does this feel like a sort of truly mobile centric and even maybe mobile specific way of solving this problem? So, three things. The first is you're absolutely right that which device you're on will radically change what it should and will look like in Arc. Okay. And so the sort of questions you're wondering at the bar when you're talking to your friend are different than when you're at your desktop on a Sunday trying to do some big research project for uh, a big purchase you and your wife are about to make. And Fair. so, yes, it will look very different on desktop because what you're trying to do is very different. The second thing is the principle behind Arc Search, which is these artists formerly known as the web browser, the search engine and web pages are archaic ideas that should be merged and blended together into a new dynamic interface definitely applies on desktop and definitely applies on mobile in other ways. Okay. And an example of that is on desktop, one of the features we just launched is something we call instant links. And instant links, you can type in, you can hit new tab and on desktop in Arc type videos of Steve Jobs unveiling the iPhone, iPod, Macintosh and iPad and hit enter and Arc will go out and it'll grab a video of each of those Steve Jobs unveiling events and put it right in your browser. You skip the search engine altogether. Right. That's the same idea. That's the exact same idea, but tailored to the thing you were trying to do on that device in that moment. So that foundational principle of there's a new type of software, a browser that browses for you that merges these three things is there. I think the final thing I'll note, which I think is more broadly applicable, is if you were to really reduce down this phrase AI, which also means kind of nothing. Correct. And you were to reduce down, reduce down even large language models, which also kind of doesn't mean anything. Just sounds fancier. Yeah. It, this sounds really fancy and smart, <laughs> but don't ask me what. So if you were to reduce AI and LLMs down to their essence and explain it to a five-year-old, the thing you would say is, for the first time, computers can read. Mm. And if computers can read, 
then they can understand, truly understand what you're asking them. And so I think really the underlying principle of what Arc is doing with this new category of software on mobile and desktop is not actually even the output. That's not what's new. Yeah, sure, it will be new and that it'll be dynamic and it'll look and feel a little different. It's the idea that you can go to Arc on mobile or desktop and tell Arc what you're looking for and what you're trying to do. And thanks to these large language models, we can understand that for the first time and route you to the right place and route you to different things in different ways that wouldn't have been possible before. That's really what's the most different to me. And I think people fail to talk about that because they tend to focus on, oh my God, it just wrote me a haiku about computers, even though why would I need a haiku about, I mean, it is wild, but that is not, that's not really what's fundamentally new. It's the fact that our computers can read and think with us for the first time. OpenAI has this product uh, or this part of their API called function calling. And function calling is remarkable. What function calling is able to do is it's able to allow us to take an input from a person like you saying, what are the best iPhone chargers? And then not only understand what you're asking, but then based on its understanding, route it to specific places and to specific things that actually have nothing to do with AI. So one of the reasons that people, including me many months ago, were a little bit bearish on all this AI hype was I was just seeing these blobs of text outputted and assumed yep. that was AI. No, no, no. That was just one output. But thanks to function calling, you can say, OK, if David is asking for videos of Steve Jobs unveiling the iPod, iPhone, Macintosh, great. He's looking for these three videos. So go to YouTube and grab those videos. Mm. There's no hallucinating there. I mean, again, it's going to get it wrong. It's technology. It's as imperfect as we are. But that's actually wildly valuable and pretty unreal. Why isn't everyone talking about that? And it's because we get caught up in these memes and these words that just mean everything and nothing to us. So function calling, it's where it's at. And there'll be more of those in the future. That's super interesting. Well, and that's also just like straightforwardly the thing that comes after search engines, right? Like you're in a certain way, all that's doing is taking what would be a Google results page with a bunch of ads at the top and just skipping all of that. <laughs> it's just saying, instead of me having to go say, where's this video, and then click on the video, and then watch the video, and then save it to my sidebar, it's just putting those things in my sidebar, which in a funny way to me is like actually way more understandable than a lot of the AI stuff, because one of the reactions to all of these things is basically like, actually, Google's very good, and it's very good at finding information, and maybe we don't need to just completely reinvent this wheel with chatbots. And to a large extent, I'm actually really receptive to that argument. I think Google is a lot less good than it used to be. But it's still, if you want to find a piece of information on the internet, Google's pretty damn good. But then the next step after Google alerting you to the existence of that information is awful. And it's because web browsers suck. And this is like why I've always thought Arc is interesting. So you've just sort of backed your way towards the search engine. And now you're, you're just like disintermediating it entirely. I agree. I think Google doesn't get enough credit for how it's innovated and pushed search forward and how actually wondrous search is. And I would push back on the idea that Google search gets us what we're looking for. Because if aliens arrive tomorrow and they're like, look, I just read this great book, God Save Texas by Lawrence Wright on the spaceship right over, and I'm looking for a new book. And you went to Google and you typed in books similar to God Save Texas by Lawrence Wright. And then, wow, magically, so fast, Google brought you what you wanted. <laughs> the alien's like, oh, wow, are those books? Well, no, not quite. Those are called links. And those links, uh, yeah, yeah, click on the link. The book's going to be in there. Oh, no, so these aren't books either. These are listicles, and in the listicles are books. And then if you click on this other thing, those are books. So the truth is that there are these abstractions that we forget about, but Google doesn't really bring, on one hand, to make it simple, Google brings you what you're asking for in the sense that it brings back a bunch of links. And on the other hand, it doesn't bring you what you're asking for and that it makes you stop at Google first. And oftentimes the thing you're looking for are buried in a bunch of links and a bunch of links behind that. And now we have the technology to say, let's just go straight to bring you what you want and bring it right to you. That's a, that's a pretty big idea. And that's exactly how a human being wants it to work. I agree and disagree with that. And I like I'm glad you put it that way because I think one of the fun things we're going through right now because of AI is trying to figure out which new ideas are better enough 
to be worth unlearning decades worth of habits and which aren't, right? Like I think about, I don't know, Siri and Google Assistant and Alexa, right? And the idea that voice is a much more natural interface for asking information than typing on a keyboard. Unequivocally true. The tech wasn't very good and also people are not used to it. And so we all kind of were just like, well, it's pretty easy to type on my phone. I'll just do that instead. I just was interviewing somebody for a future episode of the show about uh, keyboard layouts. And like, you know, what's better than QWERTY keyboard layouts is everything else. But good luck trying to convince people to not use QWERTY keyboards, right? So I think that question of can you build something that is so much better that it will actually make people make real behavioral change versus like, no, it's it's not the most human natural thing in the world that we all sort of learned how to type in what Google calls keyword ease, but I'm pretty good at it now. Like I I can get what I want out of Google pretty successfully. And so, you know, screw the aliens. What's it going to take for me to switch? I think is, is very much the open question. And this like path of AI over the next two years, I think is really where we're going to start to see where it does and doesn't clear the bar. And I think it's going to be fascinating. I agree with you. Unless you're a web browser. Okay. And this is exactly why we built a web browser. This is exactly why operating systems have so much leverage in how we use technology. In that if I were to make an AI chatbot app called Chatty, and it got really popular and wanted to radically change the way we get information, you got to remember to go to that tab. And as you said, you have this great muscle memory. You know, it may be Chatty is better than Google, but you have to remember that instead of hitting new tab or command T... Go to that chatty tab. Yep. That's really hard to your point. It really is. Yeah. It's really hard. If in fact you are the web browser and you are the text box that people type into to go to Google, you don't need to change your behavior. Mm. Your behavior actually doesn't happen in Google. Google's just a tab too. Everyone forgets that. It's actually the browser that is your interface to the web and is the browser where your muscle memory is. And then you might say, yeah, well, if you send me to Chatty instead of Google, I'm still going to be mad because I wanted Google because Chatty's not as good at all the searches. Well, great. Thanks to function calling and thanks to AI, we can know if you're asking us something that really Google is the best at, or should we send, send you to Chatty, or should we not send you anywhere? Should we just bring it to you? So one of the other features that we're launching on Arc for uh, Mac is, I hate to admit it, I have an alert set up. And not even alert. At some regular interval, I go to Google and I type news about the browser company or news about Arc Browser. And I do that a lot. We have a new feature called Live Folders where whenever there's a new press story, hopefully written by David Pierce and hopefully glowing, (laughs) about Arc, Uh it'll just pop up in my sidebar. I don't even need to go to search. So again, because we're the web browser, you don't have to change ingrained behavior. We're just going to pop it up right in your sidebar. So yes, I think people underestimate how ingrained behaviors are and how hard it is to get people to change anything because at the end of the day, they don't really care about technology. And that is exactly why we built a web browser. Everyone thought we, why would you work on a desktop web browser? It could not be more boring. Well, it's actually in in fact, because it's so boring that we want to work on it because you happen to use it for eight hours a day. And so if you use it for eight hours a day and you're all over this rectangle, if we place things in this rectangle, or if we change where you go in the rectangle when you type in something, that's actually a great place to be to change entrenched behavior without you having to change anything yourself, just abstracting that complexity. All we're proposing with Arc and this idea of a browser that browses for you is that we can then do to Google what Google did to the web, Google and all these other applications we use, which is, wow, there are now so many web apps open and tabs and Google Docs and all of these things. It's too much to reason about. I have to do 10 search queries just to find what I'm looking for. It's time for a layer that sits above that, which says, you tell us what you're trying to do and we'll go use the search engines and web apps and read the articles for you. So that's the other thing that feels so exciting is it feels like a natural kind of march of progress toward making it your day easier and easier until one day you can really just tell Arc or whatever software comes next what you're trying to do, and it will go figure out what on the internet you want to use. If you're right, two companies come to mind that are sort of perfectly set up to do the vertically integrated thing you're describing, which are Google and Microsoft. Like They're sitting on the whole tech stack more so than you are to do all of the things that you just described. Google has Google, Google has Chrome, Google has Gemini and all of it. Like all it has to do is like put three project managers in a room together and they could start to build something similar to what you're describing. Microsoft's the same with Bing and all the OpenAI stuff. And 
what's to prevent them from doing this too? I think there's real energy in the browser space because of this for the first time. And right now, so much of it is just like, we stick a chat bot in your sidebar or some of the little organizational stuff. Like Google just launched a bunch of stuff in Chrome that is basically like less interesting feature rips of what Arc Max was doing a few months ago. But they, with real energy and resources, they could outmuscle you in pretty much every direction here if they chose to, right? You are absolutely right that I view our true competition as Microsoft, Google, and Apple. Sure. I actually think Apple is the one that is in the best position to mm -hmm. do this. And they're all trillion dollar companies with everything. <laughs> of course, that is terrifying. And of course, that is going to be a big challenge. You know, there's this famous story about Google Chrome where when you open a new tab, you see the new tab page, it shows you a tile of your most frequently visited sites. Mm -hmm. And the way that they used to show those tiles were with screenshots, you know, a picture of the web page. And then this PM had this idea, you know, it's actually much easier and faster to just show the logo of the website because people can more quickly identify, oh, that tile is Twitter than it is to identify the screenshot. And that PM was right. It made it so much easier for people to quickly find what they were looking for by clicking on one of those tiles. There was a major freak out at Google <laughs> because overnight ad revenue, search ad revenue dropped by 5%, which is a huge deal at Google scale. 5% yeah. red alert. What happened? What did we change? And it turned out that this PM making it easier for people to get what they needed faster in the web browser tanked Google's global ad revenue because when you click on a tile, you're not doing a Google search. So on paper, do Google and Microsoft have everything it takes? Yes. Is there a lot of structural challenges to big public companies with shareholder pressures not to hurt the cash cow that is search ads? Yes. Sure. Can I remember the last time that Google and Microsoft invented something wildly new that revolutionized a category where nothing had come before it? No. Is this time different? Potentially. We're going to pretend like we're competing with them in a really big way. But yeah. I think that we're just going to keep doing our thing and hope that they keep loving search ads. Fair enough. So the, the reason I would think in that way of thinking to be most curious about what Apple is up to is that it seems to have a lot of those same capabilities and less to lose as a search business, essentially. Like Safari, I mean, the whole Google antitrust thing makes this very interesting with the Safari ads deal. That could get very complicated over time, but Apple seems to have a big, very successful, very popular browser that makes it a lot less, is a lot less important to its future as a company than, say, Chrome is to Google. I actually think you're putting a little too much emphasis on search. I think it's one or two levels higher than that. What okay. we're really talking about is this idea, which, by the way, is not original to us. But the idea is you tell Arc or you tell your interface to your computer or the Internet what you're trying to do. And then in this new world, it will go use whatever tools and any information it needs to do it for you and bring it back to you. There's almost universal agreement. And that's how it's going to work. And in order for that to work, you need three things. First, you need a really rich data set about each individual, everything that's going on in their personal life, professional life, what they type in text boxes, what they read on web pages, the documents that matter to their work. So you need, you need a unique data set about each individual. The second thing you need is you need the ability to manipulate all of the tools and the applications that people rely on to do what they do on their computers and on the internet. Said differently, you need them to be logged into the apps. Sure. The third thing that you need is you need an interface to your point about behavior change that people use all the time, all day, every day. They don't need to change anything they do. They just keep doing their thing. And you can then go put the future in those places. You need those three things. There are only two types of software that have those three things. The first are operating systems. The second are web browsers. I promise you there is no way that the future powered by AI will exist in anything other than an operating system or a web browser. So I, the only thing that keeps me up at night are web browser companies and operating system companies, because I think those are the only two type of companies that have a shot at reimagining our interface to the internet. So last thing, and this is a question I've been meaning to ask you for several weeks now. Did you see the Rabbit launch at CES? This little AI gadget 
thing. I saw that thing and I, after talking about a lot of the stuff that you and I have been talking about for a while and a lot of stuff you've been talking about now, I looked at that and I was like, okay, if, if Josh and the browser company had become a hardware company, this is roughly what they would have gone after. The same idea of like, okay, if the goal is to have these tools accomplish something on your behalf, instead of building me like a nice web browser that I'm in all day, you would have built me like a fun teenage engineering gadget that I can press a button and talk to all day. Does that feel right to you? What did you make of what Rabbit's up to? First of all, I love anyone that dares to dream and anyone that just goes for it. And I love that energy. They are nothing if not going for it, that team. I love anyone that stands up on a metaphorical stage and says, I'm excited. I think the future should work like this. And I'm going to dedicate my life to doing something really bold and different than what we're used to. So I have a lot of respect for that. I also totally agree that the future is going to work like you telling your computer, whether it's Arc or Rabbit, what you want to do, and it should go do it for you and abstract that complexity. I think the one place where I personally see a slightly different future is I don't want more gadgets in my mm, life. Okay. I don't want more devices. I think the secular trend to the cloud and the secular trend toward our stuff, our digital stuff being out on a server somewhere, whether it's an application or our data is that we can actually kind of free ourselves from the machines. We can free ourselves from the devices because they're everywhere. I was on a United flight last night. I was like, I'm not sure if this, for the first time, the seat in front of me could probably run the Vision Pro. It's like, it's the computers yeah. are going everywhere. And so what I'm really excited about is a world in which the computer and air quotes that you talk to, the place that has all of your data and stuff is not another new box I got to put somewhere on my body whether that's on my face or in my pocket or another button I got to remember to press instead of that other button. But, oh, wait, that's not the action button. That's the volume and screenshot. What I'm really excited about is the idea that your computing life just goes with you everywhere to every device. But I do think the rabbit is fascinating from a vision perspective and a boldness perspective. And I probably have a lot more in common with whoever started that company than um, I do with uh, someone else that I shouldn't name. <laughs> Fair enough. So what you just made me realize is that I've been talking about Arc in terms of Chrome for a really long time, and I should have been talking about it in terms of Chrome OS for a really long time. Internet computer, operating system for the web. But what you're describing, and you know, one of the things you announced last week was this thing, was it Arc Anywhere, the new syncing service? That becomes very important, right? Because what you're essentially building me is not a piece of software that lives on my computer. You're building me a piece of software that lives everywhere that I can just sort of tap into in whatever way I need to, whenever I need to. And all of a sudden, like, Arc Anywhere becomes the thing as much as whatever it is on my device becomes the thing. Arc Anywhere is the product. Arc Anywhere is okay. the computer. This all just clicked in my brain as you were talking. This is why we have to talk more. <laughs> it isn't today. I'm not, I don't want to overpromise. It is a cross-platform syncing mechanism for getting your tabs wherever you need them. But right behind you on this recording, you have a TV. It looks like a TV sitting up on a little uh, nightstand. It's a piece of crap. Never buy a Roku TV, people. Well, one day that piece of crap computer in five years will actually be a very powerful computer, just like... The phone in our pocket is a much more powerful computer than it was a decade ago. And so the idea of Arc and Arc Anywhere is that one day when you're sitting on that couch behind you, looking at that screen you're looking at, which is now as powerful as the iPhone in your pocket, you should just be able to toss it a glance and authenticate that it's you. And then you're in air quotes computer all of your apps and data and conversations and people should appear on that screen. That is the whole idea of Arc. That is the idea of this next wave, is that your computer is just an old noun for saying the stuff that matters in your digital life that is yours. And that should go with you anywhere on any screen on any device. And the way that you it should interface with it in the future is not opening seven applications and 19 search query tabs and 27 listicles. You should just tell the device in your life through Arc, here's what I'm trying to do, and it should bring it to you. It should be a, a browser that browses for you or a better tagline, because I don't love that tagline, but it feels weird <laughs> to invent your own noun. <laughs> All right, we got to take a break. And then we're going to talk Samsung and we're going to talk galaxies. We'll be right back. All right, we're back. It's been a couple of weeks now since Samsung launched its new devices, the Galaxy S24, S24 Plus and S24 Ultra. 
Which means The Verge's Allison Johnson has had time to put all three of those phones through their paces. And she's published their reviews. They're on TheVerge.com. Put them in the show notes. And like I said, post on the site with all the links you need. It's wild to think that it is only the first week of February and we might have already seen the best Android phone of 2024, but I think that might be the case. Samsung, as always, has done some of its usual upgrades here with better screens and some design tweaks and a little bit of new camera hardware, but most of what's new here is AI. There is so, so, so much AI in these phones. It's nuts. But does it add up to anything? Or is it all just another gimmick in Samsung's long, long line of phone gimmicks? Like I said, Allison has tried it all, and she's here to answer that for us. Hi, Allison. Hello. Welcome out of Samsung chaos. This is very exciting for you. Thank you. It's a recent development, so I'm happy to be here. This is a tough time because you basically had to take three different phones that are the same phone but different phones and try to figure out how to like make them make sense and also write something that is interesting to read about all of them, which is a difficult challenge. Yeah. And the same challenge as like most phones lately where the updates are just pretty incremental aside from Galaxy AI, which is a whole thing Mm -hmm. that, you know, we'll get into. But it's just an interesting dynamic looking at it this year. Like the Ultra has always been the like, we're just going to throw everything in a phone. And for the past couple of years, that has been like, this is great. Like you guys are killing it. And then the <laughs> the regular ones, the S and the S Plus just sort of felt like they're good. They're a good alternative if you're like, okay, with Samsung's take on things and you want a really good Android phone. Right. And that's sort of the case this year, but it's like slightly different. Okay. We're, we're about to spoil where I was going with all this, but I kind of <laughs> think it's the opposite this year. Oh, really? Like, so the Ultra is still very much the kitchen sink phone like it is the samsungiest of samsung phones and i mean that both as a compliment and an insult Mm -hmm. uh as always with samsung but to me i got to the end of all your reviews and i was like okay for the first time in a few years i actually think the base galaxy s24 is the best galaxy phone for most people right now which i don't feel like has been true for i don't know at least the last few years i feel like i would have always tried to talk people up Uh and now i'm kind of like you get almost all the stuff in a slightly better size for $799 instead of $1,299 Yeah, with the base model. Like, big win for the base model this year. It is. It's a big win for people who like smaller, big phones because they're all big. They are all big. Yeah, no, that sums up how I feel about them. And I guess I think of, like, the Ultra just always kind of feels like it's in its own little atmosphere. It's like... What phone do you compare it to that has an S Pen and 12 cameras, you know? That's very true. <laughs> it's kind of always felt to me like you sort of know if that's the thing you want and you want all that extra. Yeah, what feels different this year is that nothing on the Ultra just feels like, oh, yeah, I totally see why this is worth the extra money because it is more money this year. It's $12.99, which is $100 more than last year. Mm -hmm. And yeah, all of the exciting new features, like air quotes, that's Samsung's words, the AI are on all three phones, like with no differences in how they perform or any of that. And this little phone, the regular S24, just feels like a good size and I'm happy it's here. Yeah. So, okay, let, let's talk through this a little bit, because I think the first thing you pointed out to me right before we started recording is the actual physical object itself, uh, which is, again, a thing I think that is sort of carried through all three versions of the phone. Correct me if I'm wrong. But they made this thing what seems to be a little it's a little nicer. It's it's nicer to hold in the hand. Samsung has a long history of making just the slipperiest phones on the face of the earth. And and it seems like they solved some of that this time. Yeah. Well, Google took that crown away. Like the oh, pixel so is, is the most slippery it really object. Is. It should be studied by scientists. <laughs> I don't understand it. Yeah. No, like Samsung, the Ultra still has, it has the flat screen this year, which like, mm-hmm. yay, you have an S Pen. You want a flat screen. You're like running the pen over the edge. That stinks. Still has a little bit of that like note design. The S24, the S24 Plus, they I'm just going to say it, like they are just straight up iPhones and that's fine. Like they have the the flat edges. Mm-hmm. The S23 was still kind of a curved edge. It still had kind of a 
I don't want to call it a Samsung look. It had a different look to it. It's not like a drastically different change, but I find it more comfortable to hold when I go to pick it up off of the table. It doesn't like fly out of my hands. They look great. They feel great. And I think like, why reinvent the shape of a phone? Just go with what works. I agree. I feel like the two things that have always driven me crazy about some of these designs are either I'm holding it in my hand and it kind of digs into your palm in a way that feels bad or and this is really my true slipperiness test. I'm holding the phone in my hand and I go to put it in my pocket. And there have been phones that in the motion of like moving it down to put it in my pocket, I have just thrown it onto mm-hmm. the ground. Like I don't yeah. even drop it. Like I slingshot it <laughs> out of my hand onto the ground. Yeah. With prejudice. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and uh, yeah. And the Pixel is maybe the worst at that yeah. in history. But that is like the the iPhone is they they found the right mix of like the flat edges and the sort of rounded corners and it just like it feels like an object in a nice way and I'm I'm glad that Samsung has landed in that same place. Yeah my galaxy brain take is that phones over the next year are just going to converge on that design like the Mm. Pixel 9 leaks have the flat edges like this is fine let's just do it let's embrace it we're going to go there. I think that's for the best honestly yeah (laughs) it's like there was that phase with laptops where everybody was like what if they did weird stuff and they flipped around and moved (laughs) to the left and we just moved the trackpad over here and then everybody's like oh no what if it just looked like a laptop and we worried about other things and that is that is the correct answer yeah nobody's like oh i wish my refrigerator looked cooler and different than (laughs) other (laughs) it's like you just want to know where stuff is (laughs) 100 percent. so my first question with all samsung phones is how Samsung-y are these Samsung phones? And I will say, to Samsung's credit, it used to be horrific. I yeah. used to tell people, do not buy a Samsung phone because it will torture <laughs> you with pop-ups and duplicate apps and things you will hate. And I no longer feel quite that strongly, but I still mm-hmm. think One UI is a mess in certain ways. So how how Samsung-y are these phones this year? They're like tolerably samsung you okay. do there is the like list of stuff i go through when i'm setting up a samsung phone and it is much longer than any other phone i use you have to sort the app drawer so apps are alphabetical instead of just like nonsense order <laughs> sounds right there's 10 million things in the quick menu settings all that is still a reality it's it's just like And this is kind of where I keep landing with like Pixel versus Samsung is that you just kind of have to work for it a little harder with the Samsung. You put in the work ahead of time. You disable the pop up notification like sell me a new Galaxy S series phone. Like I don't need that. I'm using the new Galaxy S series phone. That was one of your best lines in the review was opening up a Galaxy S24, setting it up and getting a pop up saying, have you heard about the new Galaxy S24? Every year. It's like, guys, we're doing something wrong here. (laughs) Every year I I try. treasure that pop-up i'm like oh there it is yeah you can disable it it's just if you don't it 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 comes for you yeah you can get to a place where you can just live totally peacefully with it and it it has very good things going for it another iphone feature that they wisely stole is the always on display that the wallpaper just kind of dims so you see that all the time but you get those widgets too So you have like your little calendar widget or the battery indicator, or is it going to rain in the next hour? It's like, I love that. I should give me all the information. I think this is the thing about these phones that you are most wrong about. Uh, But that's okay. This is just personal preference. I think the iPhone's always on display (laughs) is bad and just makes me think my phone is on. And that's stupid. You're not alone. I hear that a lot. I'm going to die on that hill. It's listen, you know, to each their own. You're wrong. And so is Samsung. And that's fine. Uh, And so is Apple. I think the Pixel got it right, where it's just Mm. like, I want to know the time and like the little thing where the song is playing into that. Love that. Don't need any more than that. And just the thing where it kind of seems like I turned the brightness all the way down on my phone is not an always on display. And naturally, there's a setting in the Samsung phone. You can turn that right off with just the wallpaper part. So you can have a normal always on display. But I think that is kind of the basic difference between like Samsung's philosophy and Google's is like on the Pixel, you have at a glance Mm -hmm. and you don't you don't need to go in and set up a bunch of widgets. It's just going to tell you something on your home screen or on the lock screen like, hey, you got a calendar appointment coming up or doesn't always nail it. Sometimes I'm like, oh, that would have been a useful thing to know. But it's just kind of 
going to do those things for you. And Samsung's like, here are 10,000 settings you can mess with and you can get to a place where you get all that. I wish Samsung would dial in the balance of the defaults there a little more, but I've come to really appreciate over time, especially as Google has kind of worked down towards giving you less to do. Like part of the reason people like Android is because it is so much more customizable. Mm -hmm. And Samsung, to its credit, is like, listen, everything there is to do, we are going to give you a way to do. And I actually think to some extent that's the right approach. I wish it made better choices about how it initially sets up the phone. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I wish there were some things that were less duplicative. Like I think you mentioned that there are basically like three different augmented reality search products on this phone. Like that's bad. That's just bad user experience. But I do appreciate the thing that Samsung is like, look, do you want there to be 650 things in the settings that you can touch? We have that for you. I <laughs> yes. Seriously, I think it's it's a good thing. People like that about Android. I think it's the right thing. They deliver it. Yeah. There should just be a version of Samsung phones that is like, when you set it up, it's like, do you want to do this the easy way or the hard way? Yeah. And, and you can pick either one. <laughs> like the easy button. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so the thing on the Ultra that really jumped out to me, I have basically two Ultra specific questions. The first is the screen. And it seems like of the specs in the whole series, the biggest upgrade from the 24 and the 24 Plus to the 24 Ultra might be this new display. Was that your takeaway? If I was putting my money down on these phones, that's what I would pay for for the Ultra. It has a new Gorilla Glass that is supposedly much more scratch resistant. I put my phone next to my keys. It's bad. I always get those little like hairline scratches without fail. I don't have a single one on the Ultra, and it's only been, it's a small sample size, but so far, so good. But you're pretty brutal on phones. Like, your your review period is not easy. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't have a case. My kid will touch it. He's got, like, you know, peanut butter on his fingers. It works. So, yeah, there's that, um, which is promising, and the anti-glare coating, which is just, it's a little bit like magic. Like, it's not like some brand new technology. It's just literally an anti-glare coating on the phone screen, but you hold it up against another phone outside and A, the Ultra gets really bright. So you have that working for you and it just cuts the glare way down and you can, you sort of prepare yourself to like squint at the phone when you look at it outside. You're like, oh, I can see this just fine. Like it's almost as good as just in my house. Yeah, that's huge. And I think glare is one of those things we've all gotten used to on our phones. Like I was thinking about this reading your reviews that I've gotten used to the thing now where you kind of learn how to block the sun with your body mm-hmm. as you're using your phone. Yeah. And you, you sort of keep it down here and you like le- hunch over it to yeah. not have glare. But once you don't notice it, and like once it's gone, uh-huh. that's a huge change. And is like for especially things like taking pictures and if you have to hold it at an angle and you, you're sort of looking down off axis at your phone, like anti-glare is a bigger deal than it seems in a lot of ways, I think, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I liked it better than most of the AI features. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get to those in, in one second. <laughs> yeah. But the other thing that I'm curious about with the Ultra specifically is this zoom trade-off that Samsung made. Mm-hmm. They went from 10x zoom on mm-hmm. the lens, and then it was digital zoom in between. So if you wanted it like 5x, it was digital zoom to the opposite, where now it's a 5x lens, but you can digital zoom to 10x. I am deeply suspicious of this change because <laughs> digital zoom is a lie that we tell ourselves it's just cropping. What did you find? Is this is that was this the right trade? Was this the wrong trade? Well, the slightly less evil version of digital zoom is this like actual crop into the middle of the sensor that they're doing. And that's what's happening now at 10X. I was a big fan of the 10X lens. I thought it was great. It was so much fun. So I was really kind of bummed to see it go. But the more I kind of sat with it, the more I get it. Like 5X is more... There's just more utility kind of in every day. You can kind of take a portrait of someone if they're across the room. You're not taking a portrait with a 10X lens. like That's true. 10X is kind of a party trick in a yeah. way that 5X is like a thing you might do Exactly. Anyway. That's interesting. And it's a higher resolution sensor. It's actually a little bigger than the old telephoto. All these things going for it. Samsung is like, so don't worry. The, the quality at 10X is like actually just fine. And that's like kind of true. If you don't like I pixel peep, it's kind of a pointless exercise, but I, sure. I go there and 
I think the detail capture is about the same, but you just see the where the little tiny lens falls apart. You're mm. like, ah, oh, that's there's a little chromatic aberration. It's like that's in the one percent of like what anybody should care about. It is totally fine for just about anything else. So, and I suppose I can get behind the idea that you're trading really good 10x zoom and mediocre 5x zoom for really good 5x zoom and mediocre 10x zoom. Yeah, in real life, that is probably a decent trade. I suppose it makes sense. Yeah. Okay, I just they said they were like, oh, even at 10x, it'll look better because it has more megapixels, and I was like, I bet that's a lie. Yeah. and I'm happy to know that it wasn't. Yeah, <laughs> it just wasn't makes me quite feel better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So okay, let's talk about the AI stuff because I think that's kind of the point of these phones, right? And I think my sense of your review was basically there's a ton of AI stuff here. You tested a lot of it, but I'm curious, like for you, not as a phone reviewer, but just as like a person who has a phone, what of these AI features feels like it would actually be a thing you would use in everyday life? And leave the camera out. We'll come back to the camera in a sec. But of the like, there's the translation on a phone call, there's the recorder stuff, there's a bunch of other stuff. Like, what feels like it actually could insert itself into your life? The thing I see as the most useful that I don't, I don't currently have a use for it, but it's kind of nice to know is there is the translation stuff. So that's where you call someone and you can turn on this live translator and it'll just you talk and it speaks for you and the other person and it translates back and forth. I called V Song, our, our wearables reviewer, and she speaks Japanese. And her take on it was like, it gets the gist of it right. If your conversation is like kind of transactional or you're like, I need to make a reservation or whatever. Sure. It's going to do those things fine. She tried to tell me her cat was eating her chair and it said that she was eating the chair. It was <laughs> confusing. <laughs> Very funny. Mm -hmm. But I think that's kind of where a lot of these AI features are. You're like, it's actually more useful than not to have that there as long as you're not relying on it as like, yeah, this is going to perfectly translate, you know, whatever I want to say to this other person. Or you're not expecting like, I want you to summarize a page of notes and Mm -hmm. you're just going to blindly be like, well, my note summary, my AI summary said this, so it must be true. It's just kind of like a good starting point. That's where I see it. Yeah. And I think with a lot of this stuff, the the sort of don't rely on this too much footnote is a useful one. But I think you, you said at one point, I want to review is like, there's no way in which this is worse than not having it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so so I'll take it. Yeah. Which is fair. And I think the challenge with some of these phones for me now is Samsung wants you to buy these phones for the AI features, right? And Google increasingly wants you to buy these phones for the AI features. And I think on the camera, which we're going to get to in just a second, there are compelling cases to be made there that AI is letting you do genuinely cool, new, like worth getting this phone over another phone sets of things. Mm-hmm. I don't know that I see any of that here, that it's like none of these strike me as a tiebreaker over another device, if that makes sense. Like nice to have, you'll probably use them if you're there. Like the the recorder is a cool thing. And I've always loved the Pixel recorder, but I've never bought a Pixel because of the Pixel recorder. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Does any of the AI stuff feel like it clears that, like this is why you would buy this over something else bar? I don't, I don't know if we're quite there. I think okay. that maybe with a small asterisk for the Pixel on the like face swap stuff, which we mm. all have, you know, feelings about. Uh-huh. But that's the one that... People I talk to who are like not online, you know, are like, oh, I saw this Pixel phone does this thing. I'm like, yeah, actually, it's it's really useful. And like people see the utility for it. Yeah, there's a lot of AI like camera and non-camera that I just sort of feel like, is this helping it? Like, is anyone going to use this? Like the especially the chat assist stuff where it's like, I'll write something, but, you know, put some emoji in it or make it sound professional or casual. Like, Mm. I'll like write a text and think to myself, like, should I use this? I'm like, no, I have have no reason to try it. Right. But the photo stuff is interesting. I think it's it's at a place where it's a little more compelling to people. And Samsung's take on generative AI photo editing is interesting. Yeah. How compare and contrast it a bit to what the Pixel is doing, because the underlying models are mostly Google's, right? So in theory, mm-hmm. it's it's dealing with the same underlying technology, but what is Samsung doing differently from what we've seen on the Pixels? 
Yeah. So you kind of have the interface for the tools and they're like very similar. You go into this separate kind of editing pane of like you're doing AI and you can select an object and move it or erase it. That's kind of the same on Pixel and Samsung. I will say, though, by the way, for anyone who has not yet read Allison's review of the S24 and S24 Plus, the <laughs> funniest thing in that whole <laughs> review is a picture that you took, I think, what of your of your husband's arm draped over uh-huh. a couch that you tried to remove. What what happened when you tried to remove this? So, yeah, I, I selected it and I hit, you know, take it out of the scene. I did this on the Pixel and the Samsung and the Pixel just kind of tried to like fill in the background. It was like, there's a couch here. Mm-hmm. Samsung was like, you want a new arm made out of pillows. <laughs> and it is the creepiest freaking thing I've ever yeah. seen. And it's so cursed and it's now on the webs. It's on theverge.com forever. It's good stuff. That's what we're here for. But anyway, I derailed you. Sorry, keep going. Yeah, no, that kind of sums it up because like, I think the Pixel in like what it'll actually generate and they are running on same Google models. The Pixel's a little more prone to be like, okay, you want to fill in the background here. It doesn't always look super great. Sometimes it's really good. Sometimes it's not. But the Samsung phone, for whatever reason, is very eager to just like throw something else in there. It's such Samsung energy. I love it. It really is. Yeah. Like you, I selected a lamp on a a table and I tried to take it out and I put a different lamp in. (laughs) That's not what I wanted at all. It's like, what's behind this? Another lamp? Probably. Let's see. (laughs) Just infinite lamps. Like It's so strange. Yeah. It's Samsung energy. The one we talked a bunch about on the Vertcast when this launched was the a- ability to take any video and make it into a slow motion video. And Neil, I got like very in his feelings about how this is creating frames that don't exist. What was your experience of actually using this thing in, in life? How did it feel? So I don't quite have the same philosophical hang up with it. I'm like, okay, sure. Let's, this is fun. I can slow down a video of my kid on a swing. I think that's where most people are. It's great. That's based on the emails we got after that episode. I think most people agree with you. (laughs) All right. That's the consensus. (laughs) Yeah. When, so when we tried it out just initially in the kind of product demo time, both V, V, Viren and I were like, this is really impressive. Like it looks pretty convincing. And then you kind of throw more um, complexity at it and it falls apart a a little bit. You can see where it's like things sort of look jerky. And the one I did was my kid on a swing and, you know, he pulls him back and lets him go. And it's like so cute. And he's just like overjoyed. But then his like the chains of the swing are just kind of like flickering in and out of existence. Uh, interesting. Yeah. And then, like it's trying to decide what the, the mulch on the playground should look like in every one of those frames where it doesn't exist. So it just kind of like looks real warped and kind of it's a little distracting. Like it makes the mulch looks like it's moving looking at the yeah. video. Like, like have you ever seen the thing where there's there's just like a billion ants all together and it looks like sort of a solid <laughs> thing, but it's just like churning? Yeah. That's what it makes the mulch look like. It's a little unsettling, <laughs> right. honestly. It is, yeah. It is. It's like take something very cute and fun and makes it just a little like cursed. <laughs> yeah. The one AI thing I forgot to ask you about was the circle to search thing. And this is mm-hmm. something that is not technically a Samsung only feature. It's also on the Pixel now and it's kind of you can like hack your way into something very similar just using Google's overall multi-search stuff. Mm -hmm. But I think this is very cool and strikes me as the kind of thing in general that is like just a good feature. It's also a good reason to have an S Pen, like yay for the Mm, Ultra. Yeah. But you've tested this a bunch. I have not been able to use it at all. What's been the the verdict on Circle to Search? Yeah, I think it's something that I'm going to miss when I don't have it. It's not... It's not like you're constantly, I'm like, oh, I'm going to circle everything, search it in this Instagram post. But (laughs) when you do need it and you kind of have to unlearn the old way of doing things. Like I was texting with a friend and they mentioned the name of the restaurant where you're going to meet at. And my instinct was like, go open Google Maps and type it in and search it. And I had to backtrack. I was like, no, 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 I can I can just like highlight this in it. You know, you don't have to leave the app you're in just pops up with your everything you were going to look for in Google Maps. Yeah, I'm like, oh, this is how we should have been using our phones. Like, this feels so much more intuitive. And I think I'm going to miss it when it's not an option. Yeah, it's it's the kind of thing that 
seems weird until you do it about four times and then it's like oh this makes sense yeah it is insane that i have to copy text in a text message close this app open another app go to the search bar type on that and hit search just to get the map for the direction that this person sent me like that's a bad user experience that we're just all used to like this is the thing about ai in general that i think is kind of exciting it's just finding ways to shortcut all of that stuff because it can start to figure out oh this is an address there's really only one thing you want to do with an address Let's just do that for you. I think that's very cool. Yeah. Like, don't write me an email like Shakespeare wrote it. Just like, <laughs> give me those shortcuts. Like, <laughs> totally. Do the grunt work for me, please. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Last thing. And then I'm going to let you go. One of the big promises Samsung made here is seven years of software support, which I think in the abstract is very cool. Google also said seven years, right? So that's, we. this is now like the gold standard. I think that's very cool. Is it realistic if I'm buying an S24 to assume that I'm still going to want this phone in seven years? Like the big spec missing for me is the Qi 2 charging, which I think is whatever. Seven years from now, you'll probably want better wireless charging than this phone gives you. But even looking past that, like, is it realistic for this phone or really any phone to say I am feasibly going to keep this thing and it's going to be useful to me for seven years? For the vast majority of people, they're going to be trading in their phone before that, especially with the Ultra. It sort of feels like people who buy that phone are on a quicker upgrade cycle because they want the next big thing with all the yeah. with all this stuff. Yeah, the Venn diagram of S Pen users and people who only upgrade every <laughs> seven years, I don't think is huge. Not a big one there. <laughs> but, you know, I look at like... My parents or like, bless his heart, my husband with his iPhone XR. <laughs> yeah. They just want to not shop for a phone. They're like, I hate that. I don't want to deal with Verizon doing a whole bunch of things, Jedi mind tricks. Like, I just want my phone and I want it to work for a long time. And I think that's fair. I think Samsung has a good track record in that respect. They've sort of been pushing forward with more years of support and they were doing better than google for a hot second but uh google caught wise so i'm glad to see it i think it's it's probably gonna make a difference for a minority but i think it's important yeah and i guess i, I do like the idea that you should be able to decide to upgrade your phone before yeah. your phone forces you to upgrade it right right like i, th I think that's a good thing and i think mm -hmm. seven years is probably two years longer than even most sort of normal people will keep their phones partly just because yeah. of like battery health, right? Like it's, yeah, it's just going to get to the point where your phone doesn't charge for very right. long anymore. But yeah, then at least I'm in a position where I get to say, I want a new phone rather than my phone being like, I'm dead. Exactly. <laughs> get a new phone. Yeah. So S24, Samsung usually is like the default Android phone. Does it stay there this year? Do you think like, is this the phone of 2024 in the Android world? I think so. And I, when I reviewed the Pixel 8 and the 8 Pro, I was really impressed. And I was kind of like, Samsung's going to have to really come up with something. And I think they did. There's an asterisk. There's, you know, if Samsung software is very unappealing to you, you just want something a little more turnkey. You don't ever want to think about whether Bixby exists or not. The Pixel is a great option. And and there are things I think that are compelling about it. You know, if you do like the face swap, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's there for you. The way the assistant like processes natural language is a little better than on the assistant on the Samsung Galaxy phones. So there are still reasons to look at the Pixel, but I think, yeah, I think Samsung keeps, keeps the crown. Fair enough. All right, we're gonna do this many more times but i'm especially i'm going to play you that clip when we do the pixel 9 whenever that comes out this year <laughs> okay and we're going to see how it holds out but i appreciate it thanks allison thank you all right we got to take one more break and then we'll be back to answer a question from the vergecast hotline we'll be right back welcome back let's get to the hotline as always, the number is 866-VERGE-11, and the email is vergecast at theverge.com. We love all of your questions. It's been so fun hearing about everybody's Vision Pro experiences, and we're going to try to keep putting that stuff on the show as much as we can. We don't want to overload you with Vision Pro stuff, but we think this thing is fascinating. This week, surprise, we have a Vision Pro question. We're going to get to a bunch more of these, like I said, including your experiences, which I loved hearing about on Friday. But I thought this one was interesting and actually made me think a lot. It comes from Dan, I think. Maybe Stan. I think it's Dan. Either way, if I got your name wrong, I'm sorry. Here it is. 
Hey there, this is Dan from San Francisco. I got a Vision Pro icon in my iPhone camera app today, and I think that it wants me to start shooting in spatial video. Should I do that? Even though I might not buy a Vision Pro ever, can I shoot everything in Spatial Pro already? Or should I wait and shoot normal video now only? Help me out. Thank you. Okay, so I've gone back and forth on this question a bunch since I first heard it. And I think the answer is no. I think at this point, if you have no particular intention of getting a headset, the answer is kind of no. Spatial video has some really neat stuff going on, especially the way it's integrated with the headset. If you just shoot it on your iPhone, you're kind of just capturing 3D video, and that's all well and good. The Vision Pro has that neat way of presenting it where it has those kind of misty borders around it, so it looks a little like you're looking through a portal rather than just looking at a video. But the other thing about the Vision Pro is that actually it's a great way to just watch regular video and you can get 4K video off of the iPhone. You can't get 4K spatial video. Spatial video is huge. It's about twice the size of a normal 1080p video. So I think at this point, if you're not anticipating getting this soon, if you want to use spatial video as like the second thing you shoot, right? You're like, I'm going to take a video of my kid's baseball game. Take the regular video first and take it in the highest quality you can and then go back and get the spatial video. It's a fun sort of neat thing, but I wouldn't treat that as your main media capture situation. That said, I do think spatial video is coming in the sense that I think everyone agrees that this is a format that is going to be around for a long time. Meta is now supporting spatial video on the Quest headsets. Apple is obviously all in on the Vision Pro, both as a capture thing for spatial video and as a way to watch it back. I think this format is real, so it's a fun thing to start playing around with. I don't think it's like the 3D video of eight years ago that kind of went nowhere and now you don't really even have a way to play it. I don't think spatial video is going to die, but I also don't think it's going to be the main way you consume media anytime particularly soon, especially if you're not going to be a headset person. So I would say start goofing around with it, have some fun, but don't feel the need to like switch your default settings and start shooting everything in spatial because 4K video will do pretty well even in a headset. All right, that's it for The Vergecast today. Thank you to everyone who's on the show and thank you as always for listening. There's a whole lot more from this conversation at TheVerge.com. We'll put some links in the show notes. All the links you need are going to be on TheVerge.com, TheVerge.com slash VergeCast. That's where you can find everything. And there's tons of news going on. TheVerge.com. It's a good website. As always, if you have thoughts, questions, feelings, or S Pen uses you really want to tell me about, you can always email us at VergeCast at TheVerge.com or call the hotline 866-VERGE-11. Tell us your Vision Pro experiences. Tell us which Galaxy phone you bought. Tell us all of your feelings about everything happening in tech right now. We do a hotline question on this episode every week, which again is now on Tuesdays, so keep them all coming. This show is produced by Andrew Marino, Liam James, and Will Poor. The Vergecast is a Verge production and part of the Vox Media Podcast Network. Neil, I, Alex, and I will be back on Friday to talk about Google chaos, all the AI stuff going on, and lots more. We'll see you then. Rock and roll.